So if you found your way to Isaiah 10, uh, before we start reading there, let me give you a little bit of background, remind you where we are in history in the book of Isaiah. I know uh, Pastor Tim gave you a lot of that history again last week, and uh, there will be a test at the end of today's message on those dates, because he gave a lot of dates. So uh, better start checking your notes on that. Now, this morning, I just want to kind of give you a background as to where we are in in the sense of what was going on more than the dates, uh, though that's very important information. What's happened now is we're we're at the point in time where uh, for several hundred years now, the kingdom has been divided. Uh, Under Saul and David and Solomon, the kingdom of Israel was one kingdom, but after Solomon it was divided. The northern kingdom referred to as Israel or sometimes referred to as Samaria because that was one of the capitals of the northern kingdom, sometimes referred to as Ephraim because that was the area that was largest of the tribes in, in the north, and the south, Judah, where Jerusalem is, where the temple is, and so forth. And they are separate from one another. And at some times over their 300-year history of living side by side, they were at war with one another. Although they were all uh, children of God and part of the 12 tribes of Israel, they actually warred with one another. Well, where we are now is we are right near the end of the life of the existence of the northern kingdom. Uh, Judah had aligned themselves with Assyria, not Syria. We've got Syria and Assyria. Judah tried to align itself with Assyria in order to protect itself against an alliance with Syria and Israel. Did you catch that? So they they went and, and Ahaz, the evil king, went and he took stuff out of the temple. He could, took gold and silver out of the temple. And he went to Assyria and said to the king of Assyria, said, hey, help me. These guys are going to attack me. Let's get into some kind of alliance. Can you help me out here? And Assyria did attack Syria and Israel and protected Israel in that way, but it wasn't because they really wanted to help out Israel. It really wasn't that they felt like they were doing what they were paid for. It was because Assyria was a empire that was growing and was going to just chew up anybody in its path. It was an ungodly nation. And God, in the chapters that we've looked at before here, warned Judah, don't do this. Don't do this. These two guys that you're worried about up in Syria and Israel... Don't worry about it. As a matter of fact, you see that gal in the in the palace that's pregnant? Well, before her child knows what's right and wrong or can speak, those two guys that you're so worried about, they're going to be gone. They're going to be gone. And what happens after Assyria took care of Judah's enemies is Assyria turned on Judah. They weren't in some kind of alliance. Judah was smaller than the northern kingdom of Israel. And Assyria was a giant empire. And so after they took care of Israel and Syria, they turned their sights on Judah. Hey, let's take care of them. In fact, in a time that Isaiah prophesies about in this passage we're going to look at today, Assyria actually came and surrounded Jerusalem, took care of the northern fortified cities that were in Judah, wiped them out, and came down and surrounded Jerusalem. And the main general for the Assyrians stood outside the gate and said, Hey, you guys think you're so tough? No way. Look at everybody else that we've wiped out. You're not so big and bad. You think if we could take over these people... You're going to give us some kind of fight? Forget it. In fact, you know what he said? He said, you're God. And he used the name of God, Yahweh. He said, your God empowered me to wipe out Israel. And he's empowered me to wipe out you too. What do you think of that? Well, it was during the time of King Hezekiah. And the time that this happened... uh, 
Isaiah was still prophesying, and in fact, in chapter 36 of Isaiah, and in 2 Kings 18, you find the story of what happened. So we'll get to that in a few weeks. But just to give you the highlights of what happened was Hezekiah went before the Lord, put it before the Lord, and God came and in one night wiped out 180 or 185,000 Assyrians. So there wasn't even a fight. It wasn't that he empowered the army of Judah to be tough. No, he just wiped them out on his own and protected Judah. God miraculously delivered Jerusalem. So where we are right now, the prophecy that we're going to look at in chapter 10 was given after Samaria... Israel, Ephraim, the northern kingdom, had been overrun by the Assyrians. And what they did when they overran it, they didn't just conquer. They were brutal in what they did to people. And then on top of that, they deported everybody. They took This was the way that they controlled their new uh, little countries. They would take all of the population and deport them somewhere else. And then they would take people from other conquered lands and import them in there. So that they were so kind of confused about where they are, their culture, their geography, everything else, that they weren't able to organize to fight back at that point. So that's why we have this term, the lost tribes, the lost ten tribes of Israel. It was the ten tribes of the northern kingdom. So this prophecy was given after that had happened, but before the miraculous deliverance that we will read about later in Isaiah 36 that I just told you about. And I want you to think about something as as we start to look at this. Many times the solutions that people implement in their lives to address some problem, to address some perceived problem in their lives, the solution becomes worse than the problem. And that's what happened with Judah. They figured they'd take care of this problem that God said, hey, it's not a problem. I got it covered. I got you covered. Syria and Israel, they're not going to do anything to you. A couple of years, you won't even know who they are anymore. I've got you covered. But but Ahaz, instead of listening to the Lord, said, Oh, i got to do something. I'll go take care of Assyria. I'll get them to take care of my problem. And that happened. But then what happens? Assyria turns on Judah. You know, many addictions are the result of self-medication. Many addictions to drugs are the result of self-medication. Oh, we have a relative who has had some mental health issues through his life. It's a problem. It's a real problem. And his solution is alcohol. And so he's... uh, 30, 40 plus years, uh, an alcoholic. What he looked to as his solution became worse than the problem, genuinely. You say, Pastor, that's nice for other people, but that really doesn't make any difference to me. I'm not a drug addict, so you know I understand that. Keep your finger in Isaiah and flip over to the New Testament to Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to look at something and consider it. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 is one of the three chapters in Matthew that uh, recount to us what we normally refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus gathering on the slopes of the Sea of Galilee and preaching to the crowds. And there are a number of places where Jesus says, You've heard it said, but I say. For instance, he says in verse 21 of chapter 5 of the Gospel of Matthew, You've heard it said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you, whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, 
or you idiot shall be in danger of the council. Whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. And therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there. Go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. What's he saying? He's saying, hey, if you're in church on Sunday morning at Calvary Chapel in Pittsburgh, and you're praying and worshiping, and all of a sudden you remember that your brother has something against you and you have not tried to do something about it, get up right now and leave. And go talk to them and deal with that. That's more important than you being right here. So if any of you have that situation, you're free to leave right now. It's that important, Jesus says. And you notice it isn't you have something against them. It's they have something against you. You're to go and take care of it. Interesting, isn't it? While we were on our tour, uh, we had a uh, we went to a large church in Cleveland and we did a sound check. And then we were standing outside because it was really hot in this church. It was a church that was under construction, had no air conditioning. And uh, that evening it was very, very hot. We're outside and we're all just kind of standing around drinking some water, kind of cooling off and stuff, getting ready to uh, go in and minister in music. And one of the choir members comes up to me. I sing bass in the choir. And one of the other, actually, this guy is a contra bass, which means he's like an octave and a half below all of the basses. And he comes up to me and he says, Pastor Kevin, can I have a minute of your time? Sure, and I think he's, you know, coming to, you know, ask me some counseling or some great wisdom from the Word of God. And instead, what he said to me is, he said, "Have I done something to offend you? Because sometimes at rehearsals, I've tried to catch your attention uh, with my eyes because I wanted to talk to you, and you just turned away from me. So I wanted to know, have I done something to offend you? Are you upset with me about something?" I was totally flabbergasted. I had no idea what was going on. And that's exactly what I told him. And he said, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And now I've made an effort over the weekend. I made an effort to make sure to talk to this guy and hang out with him a little bit and get to know him a little bit more. And I said to him when he came up to me, I said, man, this is really cool, isn't it? Because this is Christianity in action. This is exactly what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 5. Hey, if someone has something against you or... If you perceive that maybe somebody has something against you, go to them. Deal with it. Because you know what happens? More often than not, there's nothing there. It's just like this situation where he thought I was upset with him about something, but he took it upon himself to deal with it rather than just to go, oh, Pastor Kevin doesn't like me for some reason. But that Pastor Kevin, you know, why do I want him to like me? You know, and those things just grow. Don't let them grow, because half the time there's nothing there. Deal with it. And Jesus says we should deal with it. Now, you know what we can do sometimes? And maybe you've said this in your life sometimes. When you're thinking about your own situation, your own righteousness before God, you know, how's my life doing? We need to take an inventory sometimes of how am I doing in the Lord? And we'll say, well, I know I you know, haven't been real good at that, and, but I haven't murdered anybody, right? We, we like put ourselves in comparison to other human beings. Well, first of all, that's the wrong measuring stick to use. The right measuring stick to use is Jesus Christ, okay? And he didn't murder anybody either. What am I getting at here? What am I getting at here? Sometimes it's not just a matter of we haven't taken the step forward to work with someone, to talk to someone, to deal with something. But we justify gossiping about that person or holding bitterness against that person because we say, well, I'm not really dealing the wrong way with this person, like going and being angry at them and fighting with them and murdering them. I'm just kind of holding on to, you know, just kind of holding on to who I am. And, and you know, okay, I'm going to be mad at him. I'm going to be bitter. And I'm going to... You know what? That bitterness will kill you. Did you know that bitterness literally, medically, has an effect on your body? Unforgiveness, all of those things. And so the cure of, oh, well, you know, at least I haven't, you know, 
gone and burned his house down or something like I'd like to. Our justification for holding on to anger ends up being worse than the initial problem. You need to be careful about that. There are men who justify cruising the internet and enjoying pornography because at least they're not committing adultery. But Jesus said, yeah, you are. You know? He didn't say if you look at the internet. He said if you look after a woman to lust after her, which is what internet pornography is all about. See what I'm getting at? It's more than just, oh, someone who's got a, a pain in their back and they start taking medication and they become addicted to that medication and the the uh, solution becomes worse than the problem. The problem that the solution brings is a bigger problem. Boy, it's in our hearts too. We need to be careful what activities we, we are willing to justify because it isn't as bad as some other big activity. And that's kind of where Judah was in their aligning with Assyria. Said, hey, this will take care of this problem, but it began to be a worse problem. So back to the book of Isaiah, finally, we'll get to Isaiah. That was the introduction. So at that rate, I don't know, 215 or so. You're laughing. Did you think that was a joke? Isaiah chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. And actually, we're going to briefly look at chapter 9 to kind of grab the context. Because what brings us to this place in chapter 10 and actually includes the first four chapters or first four verses of chapter 10 is God explaining why Samaria the northern kingdom, was judged. And he does it in these four sections, each of which is capped at the end with the phrase, but for all this, his anger is not turned away. And he identifies why why Israel, why Samaria, why Ephraim, why the northern kingdom was being judged. And in verses 8 through 12 of chapter 9, it's for their pride and arrogance of heart. And in verses 13 through 17, it's because they did not repent and and return to Him as He was disciplining them. God's discipline is intended to draw us back to Him, to turn us back to Him. In the same way that a parent's discipline is intended to bring the child back to right behavior and right relationship with the parent. That's what discipline should be. Godly discipline is about. And that's what God's discipline to us is about. Verses 18 through 21, he just says, because of their wickedness, it's like a fire. It's burning them up. And then beginning in chapter 10, he says, woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune, which they have prescribed, to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? Where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners and they shall fall among the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but still his hand is stretched out. God had judged the northern kingdom, not just because of individual sins, but because they had come to this place of in pride and arrogance and not listening to the Lord, that not only did they do wickedness, but they decreed wickedness. They established wicked laws that would give them justification for robbing and taking advantage of those who were poor and needy. God was judging a nation Not just people, but a nation. Brothers and sisters, these are scary times that we live in. We, if your life is hidden in Jesus Christ, Jesus said, don't fear. You're going to have tribulation in the world, but don't fear. I overcame the world. So what's up with fear? Don't do it. I got you covered. 
But what is heart-wrenching and fearful to see is the move of a nation, of a nation farther and farther from the basic Judeo-Christian principles that our nation was founded on. It's amazing to see. In my short lifetime, I can see a drastic shift. And not just in specific laws that allow this and don't allow this anymore, but in the culture of our society that just has accepted things that generations ago wouldn't be accepted. Wouldn't be accepted. It's amazing to see. And we should not be deceived to think that God will not judge. God judges nations as well as judges individuals. And I'm not unconvinced. I'm not unconvinced. I'm not either convinced or unconvinced that some of the difficulties that we are looking at in this nation right now, whether it be economic, whether it be what seems to me, and maybe it's just, maybe I don't know any better, but boy, it sure seems like this year we have seen a lot more natural disasters. Is God judging us? I'm no prophet, and I'm not saying that those are examples of God's judgment. But I do know that those are examples of the ways that God does judge nations. And I am saying that our nation is moving into a dangerous place of turning our backs as a nation on the very one who I believe established this nation to be a voice in the world for righteousness, for the Lord, to be a nation wealthy enough to be able to support and send out missionaries into every part of the world, a nation with morals and wealth enough to rebuild the nations that they just previously had decimated because of war. You know, I work for an international chemical company and their headquarters is in Germany. And about a year ago, while I was on a trip to Germany, I had some interesting conversations with some of my colleagues about my age and kind of getting an understanding of their perception of America and of, you know, what about World War II? What about, we didn't mention the name Hitler and we didn't talk about the Holocaust, but we talked all around those kinds of things. And because I wonder, well, what's, what's your perception on this? And one of the things I told them kind of jokingly was, you know, when I was a kid, we used to, we used to play war. And uh, Germans were always the bad guys. <laughs> and he said, you know, when we were kids, we used to play war too. And the Americans were always the good guys. Why? Here, a generation, generation and a half removed, they're still amazed at what America did to rebuild Germany after decimating it after the world war. He said, no country does that. Countries go to war with one another and then they take the riches. It's the spoils of war. But America didn't do that. Those are things that are evidence to the world of something different than humanity. We're getting farther and farther removed from that. God will judge us for that, and perhaps already is. And he judged the northern kingdom because that's what they did. They institutionalized wickedness. Institutionalized wickedness. And so we come to verse 5 in chapter 10. And he says, Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger. And the staff in whose hand is my indignation. Because stop right there for a second before we jump into the rest of this. And I want you to think about what he just said. God is saying, Assyria is the rod of my anger. I am using a wicked nation to bring judgment. I am aligning myself with wickedness in this wicked nation to bring judgment. 
How, how does that sit with your theology? How, how, how do you, does, that, does that feel comfortable to you? Let's bring it down to a personal level. What if God were to say, I am using this unrighteous, unholy atheist to bug your life in order to bring some admonishment and correction to you. Would God do that? Man, that just theologically doesn't sound right, does it to you? Maybe I'm, maybe I'm different, but it's like, can God do that? That's a tough one. But fortunately, God answers that for us. Again, stick your finger right where you are, head to the right several books to find a very little book called Habakkuk or Habakkuk. It's on page 823 in my Bible, if that helps at all. It's only about a page and a half long, so you can miss it. It's Old Testament. It's after Nahum and right before Zephaniah. If you're working off a Kindle or some electronic device, man, you found it like that. If you're in the old paper, well, you can always revert to the table of contents in the front. But Habakkuk, a hundred years after Isaiah, deals with this same issue. And the reason he deals with it is because Judah didn't learn their lesson from seeing what happened to their northern brothers. And so they are judged, and they are judged by a wicked nation, Babylon, and they are taken away. And Habakkuk is dealing with this very issue, and he says, verse 1, the burden which the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you will not hear? Even cry out to you, violence, and you will not save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. Their strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore perverse judgment proceeds. Lord, what's going on? You're letting all this wickedness come. Why are you doing this? I'm crying out to you and nothing's happening. Why is this happening that nothing's happening? Verse 5, the Lord's reply. Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I will work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. And in fact, it was told them, and they didn't believe it. For indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation which marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They're terrible, dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards. They're more fierce than evening wolves. Wolves, Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. They all come for violence. Their faces are set like the east wind. They gather captives like sand. They scoff at kings. Princes are scorned by them. They deride every stronghold. They heap up earth and mounds and seize it. And then his mind changes and he transgresses. He commits offense, ascribing this power to his God. Now tell me what in those last verses describing the Chaldeans is godly. There ain't one nothing. You can't find it. He's describing a horrible nation worthy of judgment. And what does he say? I raised them up. I raised them up. And I'm going to bring judgment on my people and I'm going to destroy the temple you built for me with these nasty people to judge you. Huh? Huh? And Habakkuk says, maybe what we would say. Verse 12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you've appointed them for judgment. O Rock, you've marked them for correction. You're of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. Why do you look on those who deal treacherously and hold your tongue when the wicked devours a person more righteous than he? Why do you make men like fish of the sea, like creeping things that have no ruler over them? They take up all of them with a hook. They catch them in their net, gather them in their dragnet. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice to their net and burn incense to their dragnet because by them their share is sumptuous and their food plentiful. Shall they therefore empty their net and continue to slay nations without pity? Why are you doing this, Lord? You, you're righteous. You can't align yourself with unrighteousness. These people 
worship their own power to do things. And you're hooking up with them? No, that's not possible. You've appointed them for judgment. I've read that. I know that. He says in verse 1 of chapter 2 very arrogantly, I will stand my watch. I'm going to set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he, meaning God, will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Like, I got the trump card on you, God. You're righteous. I know that. You say it in your word. So how can you do this? It says, the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. This was before the Chaldeans had overrun Judah. But at the end, it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Huh? Seem to remember that from the book of Romans. It's talking about salvation, right? We're justified by faith, not by works. What, what's that got to do with this here? God is saying to Habakkuk, hey, look. Hmm. Behold the proud. And I kind of think God was pointing right at Habakkuk. Behold the proud. The I know what God's going to do. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. What's the answer? Our brains aren't big enough to figure out how a righteous God could raise up an unholy nation and use them to bring judgment. That's the answer. The answer isn't about, oh, okay, here's how I can do this. Let's walk through this A through Z. And then you will know. And then you will be as wise as me. Hey, that's what Satan said to Eve in the garden, wasn't it? Hey, eat one of these apples. You'll be wise just like God. Don't you want to know everything that God does? We can't know and understand the details of everything that God does. But what does God get to in Habakkuk? He says, hey, Habakkuk, you're full of pride, man. Don't be talking to me like that. I'm God. Behold the proud. Huh. Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. You've got this righteous pride, but your soul is not upright. But if you are just, you will live by your faith. Faith in what? Faith in what? Faith is not something that has substance to it that you carry around in your pocket. Hey, I've got faith. i got pretty, pretty good amount of faith. could use a little more. No. Faith is the action of trusting in God. Faith is the action of trusting in God. Expressing that trust for God by living a life that says He is God. That's faith. And the just shall live by faith, by our faith in God that we seek Him and we seek His wisdom and we cry out to Him honestly and from the depth of our being. And when He says it's not for you to know, we say, thank you, Lord. Thank you. I trust you that I don't know that for a good reason. I will seek your wisdom, but I will not try and be on the same level as you are. I can't answer the question in some neat theological treaties with a nice bow on top on how God can use evil. It's been one of the it's been one of the conundrums of theological philosophical thinking. Maybe it would be a great idea for a thesis. I don't know. But, you know, how how can God do that? The reality is he does. And that's the point that God was making to Habakkuk. Hey, I will. I will actually destroy the temple I told you to build with wicked people, and that will be me doing that because of your unrighteousness. And the thing isn't to get wrapped up on the, who, what, what, how could God do that? Let me put that in. The basic thing is repent and turn unto God because He's judging you because you've come to this place. 
That's what he said to Samaria. But back to Isaiah, he says after verse 5, he says, I will send him against an ungodly nation, meaning Assyria, and meaning sending Assyria against an ungodly nation, Israel, because they become totally ungodly, and against the people of my wrath, and I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off not a few nations. For he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Calno like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? All places that Assyria had destroyed overrun as my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols whose carved images excelled those of jerusalem and samaria as i have done to samaria and her idols shall i not do also to jerusalem and her idols hey i've destroyed everybody and i tell you what these other kingdoms have got some really cool idols compared to this little stuff that that israel has they actually don't really have many idols at all they look their idols look a lot like everybody else's I can take him over. Therefore, it shall come to pass when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. For he, meaning the king of Assyria, says, by the strength of my hand, I've done it by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also, I have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest the riches of the people. And as one gathers eggs that are left, I've gathered all the earth. And there was no one who moved his wing nor opened his mouth with even a peep. Hey, I am tough. I am tough. Verse 13, by my wisdom, I've removed the boundaries of the people. And that's exactly what they would do. They would take a nation and pick up the people and move them somewhere else. So there are no boundaries of that nation anymore. Take another nation, stick it in there. I've wiped out the map. I've made a new map, he's saying, because I'm so tough. I have that wisdom. I am able to do that. He says, it's almost like plucking eggs out of a little nest and the birds don't even peep when I take them out of there. I have done that. His arrogant heart. And God says, I raised him up, but I didn't raise him up to do that. I raised him up and I used him like a club to discipline the northern kingdom. That doesn't mean I have authorized him to destroy nations, including Judah, including Jerusalem, because he hadn't. And he would judge them. He would judge them. That was Assyria's view of who they are. Listen to God's view, verse 15. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? As if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up? Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. And it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. When God destroyed the army of Assyria, 185,000 people surrounding Jerusalem, man, he cut down their forest, though there were a few trees left. The king himself, who had come against Jerusalem, uh, the king of Assyria who had come against Jerusalem was not killed in that battle, but he went back to his hometown and was killed. If I remember correctly, his two sons killed him in his own temple to some other god. God's view is, hey, I'm the axe man. The axe can't control me. The tail doesn't wag the dog. God has established what will be and what will not be. And even if he uses an unrighteous nation to bring judgment, that unrighteous ju nation cannot con is not controlling God. God is in control at all times. At all times. At all 
times. Maybe you feel surrounded like Jerusalem was. Maybe you see that the things that surround you and are coming against you are genuine problems, are genuine threats against you. Maybe it's physical. Maybe it's economic. Maybe it's emotional. Maybe it's spiritual. You know, a lot of times we we look at the problems around us and we go, man, the devil's really after me. Yeah, maybe he is. As a matter of fact, absolutely he is. Without a doubt. He hates you because you're a child of God. And then we, we, we get this idea like we in our strength have to fight against the devil because, man, God's like busy somewhere else with something more important. Now, everything that comes into your life is father filtered if you're a child of God. And he allows those things in your life. And you go, but, but, but this is evil. This is a pure evil person. My boss is in, and, and if my boss is listening, I'm not talking about you. This is an example. My boss is an evil person. There's some movie I've seen the, the clips for where three guys, I guess the plot is they, they're going to kill their bosses because they're so bad. You know, and maybe you have one of those bosses and you're going, man, I'd like to kill him. So instead, I'll just be angry at him. But we talked about that before. So you have to deal with that. But the, the point of all of this is that whatever is coming into your life, even if you look at it, and you go, man, this is pure evil coming against me. God has not abandoned you. If you're a child of God, God has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten you. There is nothing that can come into your life that can overcome you. In this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. Don't just not be afraid. Be of good cheer. Hey, tribulation. Awesome. That's what Jesus is saying. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Yeah. Some tribulation. Some tough times. Thank you, Lord. You have overcome the world. So it is going to be so interesting to see how you bring me around, over, or straight on through this one. This will be cool. Now, if you are able to say that and that alone when you face those situations, you're way beyond me in spirituality. But that is at the heart of the truth of what God wants us to know and to use to be the sword we fight against all of those other things that are coming in going, well, you're not really a Christian or God wouldn't let you go through this, would he? Come on. You're not a very good Christian because you can't just pray in the name of Jesus and get this devil to run and turn tail and everything to be peachy rosy. Now, God takes his saints through some tough things sometimes. And whether you're in that place or you're in that place of going, man, maybe I'm not a Christian because everything's going really well right now. The point of it is the just shall live by his faith. God has not changed. God has not moved. God is still God. And as you trust in him, whether it be looking at your life full of blessing or looking at your life full of fights right now, you are a child of God. You are in His will. So stop and listen. Let what is happening in this time mold you into the person that He has created you to be. Because you see, it says in verse 20, it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as have escaped out of the house of Jacob will never again depend on Him who defeated Him. God doesn't want you to depend on the things that you have built in your life that are actually solutions to a problem that end up being a bigger problem than the original problem instead of a solution. And He doesn't want to just add a new solution. No, He wants to free you. He wants to break all those things down and say, depend on me and me alone. That's why sometimes the things we go through, it's like, I've got nothing. I've got nothing to depend on. Maybe it was your status. Maybe it was your money. Maybe it was your health. Maybe it was your job. Maybe it was your house. Maybe it was your kids. Maybe it was, I don't know what it is. Whatever it is. Sometimes God takes us straight through the place where He says, you know what? You are depending on these things 
more than me. So I'm going to take them all away so that you will depend solely on me. Man, that is God loving you so much that he's willing to do that down to the minutest detail in your life that he knows. And in the midst of it, he calls us to live by faith. Faith that says, God is God. I am his child. These things are coming to prepare me for eternity. Lord, help me listen to know how to walk through this and be prepared for eternity. He says there in verses 20 through 23 that the remnant of Israel will return. That's what he was trying to do. In all of the discipline was for them to return. And it's not talking about a return to the land in this place. It says, return to me. Return to the Holy One of Israel. Return to just abiding in His presence. Abiding in His presence. And then in the rest of the chapter, it's really an admonition to Judah to learn a lesson. Hey, you feel threatened by Assyria? I'm going to take care of them. Fear me. Depend upon me. Don't build these other things in your life that end up being crutches and turn out to be a bigger problem than the problem you were solving. Depend on me and me alone. And in that, we find freedom. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word, the reliability of your word the power of your word to cut us, but cut us as a surgeon. Lord, I pray that you would take the truth from your word this morning and that you would help us to remove those things from our lives that we have come to depend upon, to lean upon instead of you. Lord, help us to push them out of the way before the time comes when you need to come and break them down. Lord, let us seek you and seek you alone with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Before I say amen, I want to once again, as we're in an attitude of prayer, to extend an invitation to anyone who is here this morning. If you're here and you have not made a profession of faith, that faith that we're talking about from Habakkuk, to live by faith, if that's you this morning, you say, you know what? I don't know this strength you're talking about. I don't know this wisdom. It's available to you. It's not a new self-help program. It's a surrendering of your will and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not making him your Lord. He already is. It's a matter of you saying, I will surrender to my Lord. Receive forgiveness for your sin and be assured of salvation in eternity with Christ. And if that's you this morning, you say, you know what? I never made a, I never actually made a profession of faith like that among a group of saints. I want to extend an invitation to you right now that if that's you, I want you to just stand up right where you are. You're amongst people who love you and have done the same thing. And we will pray with you and we will see and start a party in heaven for one of God's children to come home. So I'm not going to spend a long time, but if there's anybody here who wants to stand and make that profession of faith right now, now's the opportunity to do it. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you for the work that you are doing and have done in each one of us. Lord, I pray that you would... Huh, I don't have to ask you to do this. You promise that you will continue that good work. So I just ask that you would make us aware enough of the work you're doing in us the days ahead that we don't get in the way of it, but instead we are active participants in your work in our lives. 
And now may the Lord God richly bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and grant you peace every single day of your life through Jesus Christ who is our Lord and He is our Savior and He is our King who is coming soon in glory. Amen. Amen. God bless you.